so thank you for coming and I'm glad you're here to learn a little bit about what happened at annual conference and some of the goodness that James and I brought home with us. I want to begin with a reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. Before we went to annual conference, Bishop Carter um, asked everyone to come having read the Sermon on the Mount. So this is Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. So to have come, come having read the Sermon on the Mount and letting that be our guide for our life and our time together. So I want to read just a portion of that tonight as we start. And this is Matthew 5, 1 through 12, what we call the Beatitudes. When Jesus saw the crowd, he went up to the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you on my account falsely. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. As we read this passage, it doesn't take a whole lot to see that Jesus is casting a vision for those who would follow him, for a kind of people is very different from everybody else an alternative way or alternative path. The Methodist Church, for as long as it's been around, has been described as um, the middle way, or the via media in Latin. We are not uh, the Anglican Church, we are not the Catholic Church. We are somewhere in between. And in that middle ground, the United Methodist Church has always found the sort of people who tend to fall between the cracks. Oftentimes, those who mourn, those who are poor in spirit, those who are meek, those who are hungry and thirsty, not just for righteousness, but for food and water. So the middle way, or this way that Jesus gives us, can also be described as Paul does, as the more excellent way, more excellent than any alternative we might find in the world. So I hope this might be a good centering word for us as we begin in our conversation about annual conference. So would you pray with me? O oh Lord, when you saw the crowd, you began to speak and you taught them. We pray that you would look on us, having gathered in this sanctuary, and that you would speak to us and teach us what it means to be blessed, what it means to identify those whom you call blessed, what it means for us to be peacemakers and your children. Lord, make us one with you, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. So I want to do a couple of things while we're gathered um, this evening. Uh, the comments that I have that I'd like to share are really going to follow the pattern of annual conference, the theme that we had, which was connect, imagine, and engage. Before I launch into what I want to share, um, James is going to come and talk for a little bit himself. So James Jolla is our annual conference delegate, who finally got to go to Lake Junaluska, um, having been delayed for that by COVID for the last two years. Um, and we've come wearing shorts because we wanted you all to get a taste, especially of what it was like to sweat it out in Stewart Auditorium. So. Um, that's, this was the attire for annual conference. So I asked James if he'd share a couple of things, his impressions from annual conference, um, as well as I hope a little bit of his own story of why he is United Methodist. So I'll let James talk and then I'll come back. conference was uh, very rewarding so um, going through the various there was a whole lot to do and so I thought it wise to uh, kind of jot down the highlight the way I see it and so please bear with me as I go through reading them so 
Uh, <clears throat> Pastor Posey, brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, greeting and peace to you all in the blessed name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Um, it was a privilege and honor to serve as our church lay delegate to the 2022 Western North Carolina Island Conference of the United Methodist Church. As I reflect on the activities of the conference, there were many aspects that, uh, that renewed my hope and faith in God as a member of our local church and the organization we all know as the United Methodist Church. Um, to spare us the time, I will briefly uh, highlight some activity of the conference and will provide more details needed based on your interest and concern. Um, the conference started on Thursday, June 16, 2022 with um, the clergy session. I was not privy to that session. Uh, we will tell you later what, uh, what they did in that session. Um, as a member of the lay team, my session began on Friday with um, open worship service. Um, and a Holy Communion. The Reverend Dr. Edgardo Colon Emmerich, um, Dean of the Duke Divinity School, delivered a powerful message of reconciliation and the grace of God with the sermon title, After Pentecost. And in his sermon, the one phrase, um, to paraphrase what he said that I took from there was, um, he doesn't know what the United Methodist Church will look like after the general conference in 2024, but um, he do um, he do know some fact that um, Jesus Christ is risen, and also there, I think he mentioned about there being the God, and so um, so that's what I that's what I came to my mind. Um, I mean, we went into a business session after the opening worship service with a welcoming remark by Bishop Carter, and then that let us through procedural matches um, that include uh, the report from the committee on nomination, the plan of the organization rules and order, historic Wesley, uh, question for Auden that uh, Pastor Will was just talking about, and also the committee on the Episcopacy. Um, for, I mean, it was, uh, I was glad that uh, the uh, person that we elect to go to the general conference as our nominee for the Episcopal was a female. She's been a pastor for over 30 years. So I can't remember her name. Amy Cole. Amy Cole. And so Amy Cole has actually been, I believe she was a district superintendent super, for our district, district for a short period of time, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so she uh, she will be the nominee, so I, um, and Will can tell you a whole detail about it. Um, on Saturday, Saturday business session began with uh, the singing of a hymn, and then um, the Wesley Foundation um, the United UMC Foundation made their report. And um, I mean, it was worth noting that uh, the UMC Foundation was started by support from the local church. And so up to now, it has grown up to, they have assets that's equivalent to over $200 million. And so, and they use some of that money to help local churches during COVID to continue their ministry in various forms through like, YouTube or Zoom and whatever it means. So that was interesting to know. They also used some of that money to uh, help with uh, scholarship reduction for pastors and also to do a lot of other good stuff. So that's something I'll take. Um, let's see. And also doing, um, as part of that solid business session, we heard a report from the conference finance and Administrative Committee, uh, the presentation of the 2023 budget for the annual conference, um, and all of those uh, reports were accepted and voted on by the annual conference. Uh, we received a report of uh, the Board of Pension and Health Benefit, uh, and also report on the Commission of Equitable Compensation. It is worth noting that um, there's still not equitable compensation in terms of clergy members, um, you have, um, hope, hopefully I'm saying, if I'm saying something that's not accurate, let me know, correct me. Um, there is, um, in terms of men and women clergy, men make a little bit more than women, and sometimes also people of color make less as compared to uh, people of not color. So what you have is a commission set up by Bishop Carter trying to work on that uh, issue to make sure there's equitable compensation. So, um, also. And a highlight of that is um, within the uh, West, within our annual conference, we have, I think, four 
black elder in full connection with the clergy and they have all re re uh, almost approaching retirement age. So if they are retired, we will not have any person of color that is a female as elder in full connection. So this committee is also working hard to make sure they can recruit people to continue that legacy. So, all right, let's see. All right. Now it comes to the other part. Um, so there were a lot of petitions that were presented to the annual conference on the floor. Um, some of them included um, revision of the ministerial pension plan of the clergy retirement and uh, security staff. Uh, that petition was presented and voted upon. Um, there was also uh, petition number 70, which is the process for congregation disaffiliating in the Western North Carolina Conference. That petition was ruled out of order by Bishop Carter because the issue surrounding that petition is currently being discussed by the uh, Judicial Council. And the Judicial Council is almost like United Methodist Church Supreme Court. So since they already discussing that issue, it was like rule out of order because we can go ahead and vote on something that hasn't been taken care of yet. So that was rule out of order. Um, and there was also petition number 18, request for a special call annual conference uh, within the Western North Island kind of conference. Um, and so the petition has to do with some churches who, some folks who were trying to, who I think, it was made with the hope that those who were trying to disaffiliate between now and the between now and annual conference in 2023 to meet and have some form of lamenting and you know um, come together to say goodbye and all that stuff. But um, when the petition was presented to the floor, uh, the conference, the conference rejected it. Uh, and I think some of the issue raised was uh, financial stuff. Who's going to pay for it? How's that going to be? And all that stuff. So it was voted down. Um, so, okay. So we have um, those 18 churches that um, I think Bishop Carter mentioned that there's 980 something church within our annual conference. There's 18 churches that petition for disaffiliation. And out of those 18, three are within our district, which is the Smoky Mountain District. That is uh, Bellevue, Martins Creek, and uh, Lefford, Lefford Chapel UMC. So they voted to disaffiliate and uh, it was presented to the Arnold Conference and the Arnold Conference accepted that. Um, again, brothers and sisters in Christ, as I reflect on the theme of the Arnold Conference, Connect, Imagine, and Engage, um, I mean, one thing that's come to mind for me was um, as a young person in Liberia, um, it was 19, I think 95 or 96. So a group of young people within the uh, Michigan Annual Conference decided to forego their lunch for a day. And so to help with uh, camping activity in Liberia, Liberia Annual Conference. And so um, the, uh, the team of our conference was connect, imagine, engage. So they were trying to connect with us. And so um, due to that connection, it was the campaign that they facil helped facilitate by you know, uh, saving their lunch money and putting it together. Um, I happened to attend that camp activity. That was the first time that I went to a Methodist camp, even though I was in the church, but it was true, I guess, coercion for my parents. But that was the first time that I volunteered to go on my own. And so you can see, because of their imagination, what saving their lunch could do led me to where I am today, because that's just changed my whole trajectory. Because of that, I began engaging in church. Um, later on, I served as, I was elected as the my annual conference youth president. Um, and I had opportunity of coming to the U.S. to go to school. So my whole life and the life of multiple generations has been changed because of that. Uh, so, um, and in closing, like the uh, dean of Duke Divinity School that spoke, I don't know what will happen, what will become of the United Methodist Church in, after 2024, after the, uh, the General Conference. But I'm hopeful that our church will be one that will continue to connect. 
that will continue to imagine, that will continue to engage, that will continue to love all Christians regardless of their social, uh, sexual orientation, color, whatever, but will continue to love everybody just as Christ loved us all. And so, I mean, it was a privilege being there. Uh, I had a wonderful time, and um, yeah, that's it. So that's my hope. Thank you. And Will would do all the bad <laughs> So some of what James shared, and I love hearing James's story, there's this movement within the United Methodist Church that really started within the last year or so called BUMC. Um, it's hashtag BUMC. Our conference secretary said, of course, a hashtag used to be called a pound sign or a number sign, but now it's a hashtag. So hashtag BUMC. So it's people who are telling their stories about why they um, are United Methodist. And I love James's story. So I convinced James to record his story uh, while we were at annual conference. They had a camera crew there. So hopefully um, we'll be able to see that sometime and be able to share that and other people can hear that story. But I think that's so amazing, the, the bigness of the connection of what it means to be United Methodist. So I just wanna keep going, and James did a lot of the hard work for me with your report, so thank you. Um, so I wanna keep thinking about connecting, imagining, and engaging. So through connection, um, at annual conference, we got to hear at the beginning of our sessions, everyone began with a BUMC video where we got to hear from someone else in our conference telling their story of why they are United Methodist. And that was such a great way to ground us in the work that we did. When it comes to connection also, you heard Ursula talk a little bit when she joined the church this morning about wherever she went, she knew in coming to a Methodist church, she's been United Methodist, that she was home wherever she went to. And you heard James talk about you know, a conference in Michigan taking up an offering that help youth who are in Liberia go to camp. I love the connection of being United Methodist. So while we were at annual conference, we uh, got to experience and get free giveaways from all kinds of resources from our conference. Let me name just a couple of them. Uh, one is Amplify Media, which is an online resource that we already have a subscription to that gives you access to really great Bible studies for free to you. It's a subscription we have as a church um, that you could just open up and, and watch some really great uh, uh, Bible studies. Something called the United Methodist Resource Center, which is almost like a lending library for Western North Carolina. If there's a book study you wanna read, if there's a resource, they even have an enormous prayer labyrinth on a canvas that you can roll out on a big floor and walk a labyrinth. So the Resource Center Missional Engagement as an office of our conference. So they organized and set up mission trips within our conference, including folks that go over to Clyde um, and are still working on flood relief after Hurricane Fred. There was a both and ministry that helps churches think through um, and develop their technology for in-person and online worship services. Uh, and uh, Fresh Expressions which is a movement within the United Methodist Church to try and meet people where they are. So to do ministry and to do church in unlikely spaces and meet people who would never set foot in the door of a church. Um, and those are, are powerful opportunities that we create through our conference and through our denomination. Um, so we also had a lot of time of celebrations and milestones. Um, James mentioned the clergy session. So that's a session where it's only pastors and part of what we are voting on and that is receiving other clergy into our um, conference as well as approving people who have been um, passed on for licensing or for ordination. Um, and it's always a great joy in annual conference to celebrate those services where we're licensing people, we're ordaining people, or commissioning people to go out and be leaders in the church and leaders in mission. So I love those moments. So that's some of the connection that happened at conference. Um, imagine, uh, imagine. So James talked about the equitable compensation and the just compensation task force, and that there's some disparity. So a group discovered some disparity in the rates of compensation when they looked at full-time ordained clergy. They looked at full-time ordained clergy who were white, um, alongside those who are people of color and found that the difference in pay was somewhere in the neighborhood of five to six thousand dollars on an annual basis. 
And when they looked at full-time ordained clergy who were white and men and compared that to women, there was a disparity of about $5,000. Um, and we look at that and say, that's just not the way that we want to run a denomination or not the way we want to run our conference. And so they gave us a proposal to bridge the gap and it's often the case that folks are not being paid less because a church doesn't think they're worth it. It's often the case that a church can't afford a pastor. And so part of the equitable compensation plan, your portion, our apportionment dollars help make this happen, is over a couple of years, the conference will essentially supplement um, for churches in order to help bring them up um, to minimum base compensation for all clergy as well as um, increases based on years of longevity, with the idea that after a couple of years, churches are able to meet those minimum standards on their own. Uh, and if they're not, then it enters into a conversation of can they continue to have a full-time ordained clergy? I think that was really good work that we did when we think about the importance of things like equity. Um, so I celebrate that happened. Sometimes we kind of roll our eyes at business sessions at conferences, but that was really good business that we did. Disaffiliations. So James talked about the 18 churches that um, were approved for disaffiliation and how se Petition 17 was ruled out of order, didn't even come up for consideration. Um, many of the pieces of Petition 17, which would have created an alternate pathway for disaffiliation, um, are still under judicial review, our Supreme Court in the Methodist Church. So that was not even allowed to be considered. And Petition 18 was not approved. Um, so a couple of things I, wanted, I want you to take away from the conversation about disaffiliation and what comes next. Here are a couple of things I want you to hear from me. The first is no church has to make a vote. No one walked away from annual conference with an impetus to say, your church has to vote. No church has to take a vote. Not voting means that we remain United Methodist and we continue being the church that God is calling us to be. There's been a plan that's come out for the Florida Annual Conference and for ours, and I imagine others as well, called UM's Connected. And that's for people who maybe their church has disaffiliated from the United Methodist Church, but they want to remain United Methodist. So this is a way of connecting those persons with other United Methodist churches who are in their nearby area. And if there isn't a United Methodist church, then they've created an online way for people to remain in some kind of community while they still try to find where they might reconnect with a United Methodist church. Some milestones coming up for us. There will be a jurisdictional conference in November of 2022, so just a couple of months from now. Part of what happens at jurisdictional conference is the election of bishops which we haven't been able to do in six years, which is why Bishop Carter is covering two, two Episcopal or two areas right now, Florida and Western North Carolina. So we will elect bishops. And as James mentioned, Amy Coles uh, is our nominee from our conference to be a bishop. And then it'll be up to that body to decide whether or not she is elected and where she is appointed. General Conference is scheduled for, I believe, May of 2024. Nothing can change in the Book of Discipline without it happening at General Conference. So our Book of Discipline remains the same through at least May of 2024. I want to read a quote from a document called A Narrative for the Continuing United Methodist Church. And this was published by our Council of Bishops in November of 2021. So here's part of what they say for the continuing United Methodist Church. All of our members, clergy, local churches, and annual conferences will continue to have a home in the future United Methodist Church. Whether they consider themselves to be liberal, evangelical, progressive, traditionalist, middle of the road, conservative, centrist or something else we hold on to our wesleyan heritage that the living core of the christian faith is revealed in scripture illuminated by tradition vivified in personal experience and confirmed by reason 
if anyone wants a copy of this, I'll share that with you, uh, and I'll send this out by email sometime in the coming week. But James shared a story that um, Dean Cologne and Marie shared in his sermon, which comes from a, a missiologist, a missionary by the name of Leslie Newbegin. He was the bishop of the Anglican Church in India, and at some point someone asked him, they said, um, Leslie, are you worried about the future of the church? And he thoughtfully considered the question for a minute and said, no, I'm not worried about the future of the church. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. There is nothing to be worried about. So the church of the future may not look like the church that I inherited, but there will be a church that endures because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So a lot of what I came away from annual conference with, in the midst of many people being concerned about what's the future of the United Methodist Church, what will it look like? I walked away with a great deal of hope for the future of the United Methodist Church. And there are three videos that I hope you and the rest of our congregation will watch that come from our annual conference. The first um, that I hope everyone will make a point to watch comes from our June 17th conference plenary session. And it's a very long video, so just begin it at, at the first hour, minute 13, second 55. Again, I'll send this to you. If you fast forward to that moment, you'll be able to hear Bishop Carter's remarks on his hope for a continuing United Methodist Church. And he tells stories and casts a wonderful vision that speaks to the heart of what this uh, narrative of the future United Methodist Church tries to share. That is a hope in which the United Methodist Church continues to be a vital home where everybody has a place where they can grow in faith with one another, where they can serve God and our neighbor, and where we can be committed to the living core of our faith. He had a couple of resources that he quoted, and I want to share some of them with you. One of them comes from a, a, a line that John Wesley learned from our Moravian brothers and sisters, which is something that we think about in times of disagreement, about all kinds of things. The phrase is, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. In essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. Which is a phrase that can become for us a helpful guide for considering how do we live with one another when we disagree about things that matter a great deal, and yet we still want to stay under the same roof. And he shared some other um, helpful quotes, I think, from our history and our resources. John Wesley writes in the character of a Methodist, As to all opinions that do not strike at the root of Christianity, we think and let think. And in a plain account of Christian perfection, he insists that orthodoxy or right opinions is at best a slender part of religion if it can be allowed any part at all. And in Wesley's sermon, The Catholic Spirit, Catholic meaning not Roman Catholic, but universal church. He quotes 2 Kings chapter 10, 15. If your heart is right with my heart, if it is, then give me your hand. And here's how Wesley interprets that. Give me your hand. By that, I do not mean be of my opinion. You need not. I do not expect or desire it. Neither do I mean I will be of your opinion. It, I cannot. It does not depend on my choice. I can no more think than I can see or hear as I will. Keep you your opinion, I mine, and that as steady as ever. You need not endeavor to come over to me or bring me over to you. I do not desire to dispute those points or to hear or speak one word concerning them. Let all opinions alone on one side and the other. Only give me your hand. So I hope that you'll take some time to watch that address by Bishop Carter from June 17th. And I hope that you'll take time to watch the worship services from our opening worship and our closing worship. Opening worship, the sermon by uh, Dean Edgardo Colon Emeric, and in our closing worship, the sermon by Bishop Carter, in which he once again tells some really poignant stories from his own life of how he found United Methodist Church to be a place that welcomed him when others didn't. Um, 
and how he hopes that we can continue to be that kind of a church. So engaging. We want to be one with Christ, um, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. And I know that a few quotes doesn't settle anything. A few quotes doesn't settle an important matter, but settling the matter is hardly the point, if we're being honest. Rather, being able to stay at the table in love, with hearts at peace. Hearts at peace that see another person as a person just like me, that's the point. John Wesley also said there's no holiness except for social holiness. That is, holiness, my holiness, isn't something that I can achieve when I cut myself off from you when I don't like what you're doing. Or when I cut you off from me because I don't like what you're doing. But rather, holiness comes when we pursue the love of God and, the lo and loving our neighbors together. So, one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. I want to close by sharing why I am a United Methodist, and then maybe you can ask James and I some questions, and we'll do our level best to answer them. I am a United Methodist because the United Methodist tradition um, is a conjunctive faith. Conjunctive. I am an English major. A conjunction is that word or that literary device that binds together two otherwise independent clauses that could stand alone. Conjunctions are words like and, or, nor, for, so, but, yet. Okay? Sometimes a conjunction holds together two things that are different. Sometimes it explains a rationale for the thing that came before it. I've seen Bishop Carter use the plus sign when he uh, signs his name, or he uses a plus sign instead of using a bullet, which is always confusing to me of where that comes from. And I don't know his intention exactly, but for me, the plus sign becomes a sign of our conjunctive faith, that it holds things together. We are a both-and tradition. We're able to say not it's either this or that, but we say it is both this and that. We hold things in tension. For instance, I'm a United Methodist because we hold together the fact that we are a faith of both head and heart. We don't check our brains at the door, and we lead from our heart. We hold together God's sovereignty and our free will, personal piety or devotion, and social action, the importance of local service and global missions, that we are a church that is deeply traditional. And part of our tradition is that we are always innovative. So we are a traditional and an innovative church. And those are the reasons that I remain United Methodist. And I've heard recently someone describe how we lead or we plan with the end in mind. And for us as United Methodists, the doctrine that I love the most is one that most people wrinkle their nose at. And it's the doctrine of entire sanctification or Christian perfection. It makes most people go, ooh, but it makes me say, ah. Oh. The doctrine is one that John Wesley describes and says, this is not my doctrine, but it is Christ's, who says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's in the Bible. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And by that he means not that we are without mistake, or that we are without temptation, or that we are without infirmity or illness, but that we have the love of God alone in our heart. That everything else gets pushed out and nothing remains but the love of God alone. And that Christ doesn't give us any command that cannot be fulfilled. So that we expect and hope that we might be made perfect by God's love in this life. That is the most beautiful vision for me for our own lives for our life together, and for the world. In the United Methodist Church, I find the most beautiful doctrines of grace and love and vision of hope for the future. And I can't imagine being apart from that. And so those are some reasons why I remain United Methodist, because I find a vision that is both beautiful and inspiring, and I don't want to be apart from that. I'll stop there 
Um, and maybe if y'all want to ask me and James some questions, uh, I'd be glad to field them. James maybe would be glad to field them. He might, whether he's glad to or not. Um, so let me just pause and ask if you all have any questions that you want to ask us about annual conference, about the United Methodist Church right now, or, or whatever may be on your mind. So does anyone have any questions that you'd like to ask? What do you mean? I mean, like, can they, will they be allowed to disaffiliate anyway? Or, or will they have to pay for their property? I mean, or that, that, that kind of thing? There? Good question. So the churches that we approved for disaffiliation, that's going to go forward. Those 18 churches are going to be disaffiliated, and in the next couple of months, they will no longer be United Methodist. They're using a pathway. Um, oh. What if I could Thank you, 2553, paragraph 2553, which was added to the Book of Discipline at our call general conference in 2019. That's a legitimate pathway to exit the denomination for reasons of conscience surrounding um, the United Methodist Church's um, positions on homosexuality and any conferences action or inaction related to that. So that's a legitimate exit pathway. Petition 17, which was ruled out of order, tried to interpret another paragraph in the Book of Discipline as a legitimate pathway to exit the denomination. That pathway was ruled, um, or is under review from the Judicial Council. Um, and so those, no church can pursue that as a pathway, a legitimate pathway of exit, until the Judicial Council makes a ruling. And even once that happens, it won't be until annual conference next summer when a church can take advantage of that opportunity, or could could, could take advantage of it and actually disaffiliate. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> so the churches that have already moved to disaffiliate, they are. Um, and there's still a pathway for those desiring to do so. Can you speak, speak um, about what the pastor's role in those churches? You mentioned that you don't have any mention of Charlie and Mrs. James. The role of the pastor in those churches that Um, I guess I'll say two things about, I'll say something about the place of the pastor and the role. So it may well be that there are situations in which um, a church might choose to disaffiliate and the pastor doesn't. So in that moment, as soon as that church is disaffiliated or after that church is disaffiliated, they would, be, they would need to find a new clergy. Because um, a United Methodist pastor um, would not be serving in a global Methodist church. Um, Reciprocity would be a word that maybe we use in other um, vocations. So there's not reciprocity um, between those two um, bodies at this moment. Maybe in the future, but that'll be kind of down the road. But the role of the clergy person. So if a church initiates a process of discernment and potentially disaffiliation, it's the pastor's job to facilitate that process. Um, a church may choose an outcome that doesn't align with the pastor's desire for themselves, but it becomes the role of the clergy to help a congregation discern what is the will of that body. Uh, and a pastor's role is to walk with the church through that process, um, whatever the outcome might be. Does that answer that question? Okay. This might be a... Confusing question. Well, I might give a confusing answer if that's <laughs> well, all right. I, I kind of envision an analogy between or an association with the recent uh, Supreme Court of the United States action with regard to the abortion issue, mm -hmm. whereas there was a leak ahead of time, an official action mm -hmm. that caused some concern and action on the parts of various groups. Now, relating that to disassociation, I wonder what, what would be the range of concerns of those who have already disassociated before there has been an official uh, conclusion to 
to, to that act, to the action as a United Methodist Church as a whole. Do you, uh, do you understand what I'm asking? You're, so you're kind of asking, there are people who may be wanting to disaffiliate now, like individuals, so what are they doing between now and any action that gets taken? Is that kind of what you're asking? Well, no. He, well, Take a crack at it, James. The way I understand what he's trying to say is um, because of the, uh, I guess, last general conference, we got into traditional stuff and then I think the more liberal, what have you. Uh, and so uh, those churches that that choosing to go ahead and use Article 2553, which is already been trying to go to discipline, to disaffiliate, uh, which is okay, but then without the whole issue that has been discussed before the Judicial Council coming to fruition, before they come up with their decision, those who are choosing to disaffiliate, um, am I on the right track? So on, so on. <laughs> so, uh, what was the question again? <laughs> What was the end part of your question? Um, so I think what what I got from his uh, I get question is uh, so those who were choose those who were choosing to disaffiliate without the judicial council coming up with a resolution, what will happen to them after that resolution is made? Well, not really. Okay. What I was pointing to uh -huh. is what is the basis of their reasoning for wanting to disaffiliate? Oh, what's oh, the reason for wanting to disaffiliate? that haven't come down. Gotcha. Yeah. So disaffiliation, the presenting matter for disaffiliation is largely a disagreement around a church's position around homosexuality. Um, the ordination of gay or lesbian folks as well as same-sex marriages, which has been a, a conversation in the United Methodist Church for going on about 50 years now. Um, so those, you know, in 2019, our general conference affirmed a traditional view of marriage and ordination and human sexuality. Those churches that are disaffiliating are looking at the ways that they see the United Methodist Church, at least in America, and they're saying, it looks like we see the writing on the wall and that the church is probably gonna increasingly move to a place where ordination of gay or lesbian folks becomes approved, um, as well as um, same-sex marriages. And they said, we don't wanna be a part of a church where that's allowed. And so we're choosing to disaffiliate. That's really a presenting issue for a lot of folks. Wrapped up in that, there are other matters um, that people would talk about, such as um, differences in interpretation of scripture. Um, for some, there's a matter of um, viewing their property, property and finances becomes an issue for some people. Um, some who are choosing to disaffiliate see this as an opportunity, in, in some people's words, to get their church back. Since, 19, since 1797, all church, all United Methodist Church properties have been held, what we say, in trust. So this building really, at the end of the day, is held by the United Methodist Church. Um, so those churches that disaffiliate were able to walk and keep their property. So they were able to keep their churches and their church buildings um, and are no longer obligated to pay apportionments. And you can take obligated to pay apportionments in a couple of ways. On the one hand, you could see apportionments as the tax you pay to the United Methodist, or you could see it as the gracious way that God has opened for us to minister to people around the world, which is how I see apportionments. It makes it possible for a conference in Michigan to create a summer camp for James in Liberia. That's what apportionments do. So those are some of the presenting issues for people that are wanting to disaffiliate. Does that help? Did that get out in some way? Yeah. It's just such a shame that not only have you got a, a split between conference and church, but you're also going to have a split between congregations. That's right. And pastors. That's right. And that's right. And I think what Tom's saying is that they're doing this without the decision having been made. Right. The decision's still waiting. That's oh, okay. You know, and, yes. And, and if now we can. If yeah. they decide to stick with the traditional interpretation, those churches that are disaffiliating over this issue have disaffiliated 
for nothing. That's true. In many ways, like you're saying, the, the Book of Discipline won't change until 2024, which is to say the traditional language of our Book of Discipline is still there, and it will be until 2024. Um, but I think those churches are leaving because they're, they're tired of having the conversation. And for them, the matter is settled, and they're ready to simply move on in some ways. Even if it's putting the cart before the horse. Even if it's putting the cart before the horse. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So on the other side of that coin, people are reading the writing on the wall, so to speak, because they think they know where it will come down at the end. None of us do. We all have our hopes, but but some people think this is a done deal. Yeah. So not always. Grant, you have a question? Question, Brian. Um, General Congress is the Methodist Church worldwide. Yes. Yep. And the movement to change the book of discipline to be more progressive is mainly an uh, American movement. The rest of the world, or a great part of the rest of the world, is still very much in favor of the book of discipline remaining traditional. Is that not correct? Generally so. Yeah. I think generally, yeah. So. Their idea is that the, that the church is going to change to allow a broader definition on human sexuality still may not happen in 2024. It could get voted down by the rest of the world, but it won't change sure. what the, the state says. And it's my understanding that the Methodist Church is growing in the rest of the world and declining more in the United States. So we have a, a smaller vote here. Sure. It's complicated. And another part of, it can very easily, we can very easily um, talk about any change in the Book of Discipline in terms of progressive or conservative. Um, a word instead that Bishop Carter has used, that the Commission on a Way Forward used, was contextual. Contextual. So amending the Book of Discipline in order to allow for more contextual ministry. So in, in central conferences, or conferences outside of the United Methodist Church, there are abilities to adapt the Book of Discipline in order to, to meet a particular cultural context that remains faithful to the living core of our tradition, but that does make some amendments. So part of the idea might be to make the Book of Discipline more um, open to contextual ministry. And I think that's a better word um, for it. What other questions might you have? I would encourage you as questions come to you, perhaps, um, from other people where someone says, I'm really worried about the future of our church, or I'm really worried about the future of the United Methodist Church. I want to ask you to do a couple of things. I want to ask you to share with them your hope for the future of the United Methodist Church and your hope for the future of this United Methodist Church. And I want you to also listen. And if a person asks you a question and you know the answer, by all means, share the good information that you know. But if you don't know, I wanna ask you to help me and say, why don't you ask Pastor Will? Um, and if they don't have my cell phone number, please give it to them um, and ask them to give me a call. I'm, I'm always more than happy to talk with anyone um, about any hard question. Um, so please send folks my way and uh, we'll continue to have the conversation. And as questions come to you, I hope you'll reach out to me or to James, um, who did a much better job of summarizing annual conference than I did. I don't want to cut us off prematurely, but I also don't want to omit any question that someone might have before we go. So that last bit was almost a stall tactic while you decided whether or not you wanted to ask the question that you had uh, on the tip of your tongue. So are there any other questions that anyone would like to have? Hmm? A church that's disengaged or dis... Disaffiliating. Disaffiliating. 
Do they still call themselves Methodist? No. Well, um, they might call themselves Methodist, but they could no longer legally call themselves United Methodist or a United Methodist Church, nor could they use any of our officially branded stuff. So they can't use a cross and flame any longer uh, or any of those officially licensed kind of denominational resources. So they're standalone, more or less. They don't participate in the mission work that we do so forth? Potentially so. Um, some will choose to remain independent so it will be an independent church kind of on their own. Um, others might choose to affiliate with another denomination, such as the Global Methodist Church that has been newly formed. Um, but some, some will remain independent, others will choose another pathway with a different denomination, but they no longer are United Methodist. this book while I wait again in case the question comes to you. Okay. Uh, if you have more questions, like I said, I hope you'll, you'll reach out to me um, or send folks my way and, um, and hope we might continue to be a hopeful people. Uh, I want to close with a prayer that Bishop Carter offered um, several times and that is in the end of his book, uh, embracing the Wideness, which I've mentioned before, and is a really excellent uh, read for the future of the United Methodist Church. And this prayer comes from Tom Langford, who is a clergy person from our conference, and who at one time was the dean of the Duke Divinity School. So let me close with this prayer. Will you pray with me? O oh God, your intention to give exceeds our readiness to receive. Your boundless love is restricted by our small vessels. Your generosity far exceeds our responding reception. Your richness is restrained by our poverty of expectation. Your expansiveness is channeled through our small hearts. Enlarge our capacity. Increase our receptivity. Open us to your full life. Make us more able to receive your generous grace. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight.